Today we're looking at this objection people raise. You want me to follow Christ with you, but you're always going on about money. Now we live in a part of the world where the chapels are very keen on getting their annual contributions in. Much like the hunt is very keen to get its annual contributions in. Or, or you know, some other organisation in society is keen to get the contributions in. And it's resented. Because around here, and if you realise this, but the chapels around here have a thing called the report, the draw the ad. Uh, and it lists who's given what across the course of the year. And if your name's not on it, there's, you know, social ostracism. The family ring up and give you help because you haven't given this year. A lot of young people around here would never go near chapel, have to do that, and they'd really resent it. The church is always going on about money. And you might want to say, well, nobody else is then? You're joking. That's not the point. It's not that. It's the implication that it is my money that you, the church, are always going on about. And you're all going on about it because you're trying to get hold of it, and I don't want to give it to you. That's the basis of, of this objection, as we encounter it. And it's common, it's common in this part of the world, it's common across the water in the Atlantic, across the Atlantic in America, we hear about it all the time. It's a common problem. Just looking over the Bible verses that contain that word money, you know, it becomes very obvious very quickly. It's not money, it's meanness and it's materialism that are the issues, not the money itself. But here is the way the objection comes flying at us. You want me to follow Christ with you, but you keep going on about money. The implication being, you're trying to get mine off me. And of course, Christ does call people to himself. And away from fixation and being fastened to the money that we transiently hold. Or he calls us to enjoy using it for things that are going to last forever. And that means loosening our grip on it, doesn't it? And that's where people who are prepared to actually trust Christ, or not prepared to actually trust Christ, that's where they start getting surety about it. Constantly talking about money in the church. There's sadly quite a lot more to this objection than that, and we need to take it quite seriously. So, what's the Bible got on it? Well, first of all, it's got 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10, which talks about people of corrupt mind, who've been robbed of the truth, who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. It talks about that in the Bible. Paul is writing to Timothy about people troubling the church with unsound and ungodly teaching in Ephesus. We know it's Ephesus from chapter 1, verse 3, where Timothy is at this time. And here's how Paul in this passage now characterises those people who are troubling the church. They're people of corrupt mind. They've been robbed of the truth. They think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, have pierced themselves with many griefs, because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. There are people out there in the churches, Paul writes, who do think of godliness as a means to financial gain. But look what he says about those people. Those people who use godliness, in inverted commas, as a means to gain, they are people who have been robbed of the truth and are people of corrupt mind. We're coming back to this. But, there is a complementary truth, and balance is difficult to achieve on this subject. And the complementary truth, in the very chapter before this one, goes like, goes like this. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of the double honour. Especially those whose work is preaching and teaching, because scripture says, don't muzzle an ox when he's treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. So, look, it's not fair funding that's the issue here with, with what Paul's writing to Timothy. It's profiteering on the one hand and meanness on the other. And at the heart of all of that, the love of money, which is a root of all kinds of evil, says verse 10, chapter 7. Now, can you immediately see the mistake I'm making here? Because we're looking at passages of Scripture and... and I am assuming too, they are assuming, and I am assuming we are talking to Christians. Because the texts we have looked at come from letters, and these letters are written to churches. But this objection we are trying to deal with and talk about here, this objection people have around us, against coming to Christ in the first place, it is coming from those who don't believe. And it is coming because we are going to those people and saying, give us your money, before saying, is Jesus.
So let's clear this up. This issue of money being taken or asked for from people who don't believe, as we understand, haven't got biblical faith. See, by the time Paul is writing to Timothy, by the time of the New Testament, it would be so unthinkable to ask for money from people who are not committed to Christ that we need to take ourselves back even to the Old Testament to learn this principle. Because as he prophesies, the nature of the new covenant that God would provide long afterwards, Isaiah characterises the sort of covenant that it's going to be. And here's principle number one for today. There are going to be three principles around this objection. You're always asking for money. Don't expect me to follow Christ with you. Principle one is this. The gospel to outsiders is free. It's free. It's a really, really important principle. It's lost some ground in recent years. But it's free. Who read Isaiah 55 for us? Was it? Mandy, yeah. Look, come all you are thirsty, come to the waters, come where you have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Come to our God, for he will freely pardon us, Isaiah 55. When the gospel was being prophesied, or the very nature, the character of the gospel that was being prophesied, from the 8th century BC, is that it's going to be free. It's free at the point of delivery. It's free at the point that you're being called to it. And when people query the wisdom, the sustainability, the long-term viability of this gospel being free at the point of delivery, God says immediately after this bit we read in verse 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. He says that in the very context of not charging for this new gospel that's coming at you. It makes no sense to the accountants, but there are higher laws at work than even this, says Isaiah in this passage. Now that free of cost character, that free of cost offer, that is of the essence of the character of the new covenant, it comes in two specified ways. Firstly, the invitation is free. Come, no money, without money, without cost. Come, free. It's a free lunch. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's paid for it, right? God's paid for it. God's paid for it. It doesn't mean there's no cost involved. Christ has paid for it on the cross. You want to see how costly it is over the cross. It doesn't mean there's no personal cost to commitment. It does mean that as one Simon and a magician was to discover through embarrassment in Acts 8, you can't buy the gift of God with money. This is the gift of God. And you can rationalise where this all comes from. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. Right? The gospel comes by the free gift of God. It's a Romans 3 issue all over again. No difference between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, what's that word? Freely by his grace. Don't stop charging for it then. That's a practical question, isn't it? It's a practical question. It raises all sorts of questions about charging for evangelistic events. Do we do that? It raises all sorts of questions about passing an offering bag under the noses of guests. He's doing gospel services. How many churches do we go into? And we take friends along. And we're embarrassed if we take friends along because along the pew comes the basket or the bag. What are we doing? It raises all sorts of questions about charging membership or subs at youth clubs that are open to unbelievers or non-believers' children. Raise those questions here because we don't do that. We won't do that. We won't do that however tight things are for money. We might receive gifts from social funds if you're providing a social benefit to somebody. That makes me slightly uneasy. We might even conceivably in the future run fundraisers, say a dinner or something for a charity that people who are not yet believers with us would be happy to support. We will not be charging unbelievers to hear the message that we want to convey to them. And we're not a big church. And we're in a situation where you know, giving in churches has fallen off a cliff. Somebody who uh, is involved in, in you know, Christian work um, said to me recently, the situation now in this country appears to be that God has got no money. You can't get money for God. You have to run projects and apply to charities and trust funds to support you. God's got no money. And that's the problem. Christians in Wales are particularly in trouble. A prominent Welsh evangelical leader put it to me almost a decade ago. 
Wales is very funny about money. And in response to the austerity that's come into our economy in the last five years, individual Welsh evangelicals who have jobs and mortgages, they appear to cut back on their gospel giving, but are taking the opportunity to crank down their mortgages because of you know, low interest rates. This is much a burning issue because of the situation we're in. The invitation of the gospel prophesied in the 8th century BC was going to be this. You don't charge for it. You don't charge for it. It's an essential characteristic of the authentic Christian message that its invitation comes free of financial costs. So it's going to cost us who have reason to be grateful for it. Because that's the only other way to fund it. And because that reflects the free at the point of delivery character of this gospel. Here in Scientology, certain film stars are very much involved in its very trendy cult in America. Christianity is not like that. Where you have to pay, forgive me if I've misunderstood, but my understanding goes like this. My understanding is that getting into and progressing in Scientology, for example, there are other examples, requires taking courses that can turn out quite expensive. You want to get into yoga or TM and stuff? It's going to cost you. It costs money. Isn't Buddhist meditation TM? Isn't that all the same? Our God has foreordained and our God has prophesied and brought to fruit a system where you do not pay to come to Christ. Because it's a free gospel. And we are the ones who must make the sacrifices necessary to sustain that. Because we've received a great deal. Now, if we understand the simple basics of this gospel, we will know that by very virtue of its essential character, and by virtue of what God says about it from way back in the 8th century BC when Isaiah wrote about it, the essentials of the gospel itself should lead God's people to prevent the situation ever arising where our unbelieving friends can ever accuse us that they want to follow Christ with us, but we're always going on about money to them. It's of the nature of the gospel that this shouldn't happen. Does that make sense? So that sort of situation can only arise where we haven't understood the essence of the gospel and or where the outstanding generosity of God towards us in this gospel has not borne fruit in that grateful generosity that it should bear as fruit. Is that a long sentence? Either we haven't understood the gospel as nature itself or we're just not grateful for it. Those are the only conditions where they can where we, where we can behave in such a way that they come back and object to us. We're always going about money. There's the first principle underlying the understanding of the gospel. The gospel comes to its outsiders free of charge. By invitation and by fulfilment. Come, no money without money without cost. The fulfilment goes like this. Let them turn to the Lord, he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. He ordains that it should be so. Is that okay? Principle number two. Given that that's the case, preaching, communicating this gospel costs believers. First principle, the gospel to outsiders is free. Secondly, preaching this gospel costs us. Us. And that's in the chapter before the one that we're looking at, which deals with the objection, really. Preaching this gospel costs believers. The elders and directly affairs of the church, while they're worthy of double honour, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. The scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. But I wonder if Paul had thought about that, because you know, he's calling himself <laughs> he's calling himself an ox, isn't he, really, uh, in that situation? Don't muzzle an ox while he's treading out the grain. The work of his ears is costs believers to maintain the elders. Who are the elders? They are those who are the apt to teach ones. They are the ones who are apt to didactic us. What is an elder? An elder is there to preach and to pray. To teach the Bible and to pray in all sorts of contexts. But to do those two things. And the other things in the church, from Acts 6 onwards, were kind of forbidden to them. Because they were not to get involved in these. They were to do that. Act to teach ones. Uh, it's, a, it's an expression in 1 Timothy 3, again that's two chapters before this, isn't it? The only ability as such mentioned in the list of requirements for an elder in 1 Timothy 3 is the ability to teach, being apt to teach. 
not a didactical loss necessarily, a teacher, but to be didactic loss able to teach. So let's get back to what it says in 1 Timothy 5 and uh, Greek alert, but I'll colour it in nicely and explain it. Here's what it says in 1 Timothy 5 17. The well ruling elders of double honour have to be thought worthy, especially those who labour. It doesn't say those who work at preaching and teaching. It's a word for heavy toil. Uh, it's double digging the garden. Uh, it's pushing a heavy load up a slope. It's hard work that breaks sweat. It's that sort of word. Here's what it says. Copy over to it. those who work hard, those who are uh, struggling, striving, breaking the sweat at preaching and teaching. Fundamental to the healthy life of the church. The forward progress, not a recruitment for our Sunday morning. You know, you can, you can fill your Sunday mornings by good organisation, by appealing to social needs, by providing a good party. You can fill a Sunday morning by all sorts of means. We're not talking about that, but these things, these ministries are essential to building the church, building the kingdom of God. Specifically, then, those teaching elders are worthy of double honour. Those who rule, not please you well, but rule well, especially those who put very hard work into the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And for these, more than, their more than adequate remuneration comes as wages. It's, uh, it's this bit about not muzzling an ox. Um, we don't use oxen much, we've got things like you know, tractors, it's great, and electric motors, it's brilliant. Um, so we don't necessarily think about that so much, but in those days you'd have a grindstone, and it'd be heavy, and you'd have a bar coming out, and you'd have an ox attached to the end of it. And the old ox would spend his day, would go, go around in circles, literally, turning this um, grindstone, uh, mill, mill wheel, isn't it? What would you call those big, you know, flat, big, flat thing on another big, flat thing, and the grain goes down the old in the middle, and it's got ridges in it, and as it turns around, it grinds the grain, but the ridges pull the stuff out the outside, yeah? So the old ox is in there putting heavy working, working hard, so he needs more than just grass rations, because he's working hard. He needs more than just the grass rations he can find for himself after the working day when his muscles have grown tired and, and, and aching in your service. He needs high grade protein, protein to sustain his labours in the long hours of his life which he lays down to grind the grain to feed you. Don't put the muzzle on him. If he needs it, let him have it. And it's wages. It's not charity. Preaching costs, not the unbelievers who benefit, but the believers who've already benefited, already been fed from the generosity of Christ, who's called these men to this ministry and sent them to you. So Paul is saying, don't muzzle his oxen or your lampstand will be removed, possibly by, by your ox's premature death. But, but there we are, that's another question altogether. Preaching this gospel costs believers, and that's where the responsibility is put. It's exclusively for teaching the Bible, but the responsibility is put. Principle one, the gospel to outsiders is free. Principle two, preaching this gospel costs believers. Principle three, profiteering from this gospel proves unfaithfulness. Have we got a balance now? Are we, are we getting the balance worked out? Or we put anybody to sleep. <laughs> it's one or the other, isn't it? You're going to see why it's so important in a minute. Wages, fair wage for fair day, not means tested welfare benefit, doled out at the minimum level can be got away with. And it costs, and it costs believers, because feeding with the Word of God is the life of the church, but it's costly. And it is actually biblically a disgrace for God's Word to be funded by reluctant unbelievers who then resent it and reject the gospel. <clears throat> the common allegation against the church and objection to the gospel on the basis that the church has always gone on about money, it can only legitimately arise when the first two biblical principles we've looked at are violated. Because the accusation that people are profiteering from the gospel applies biblically only when the faith is being denied by those who claim to be its advocates, when they're profiteering, when they're trying to put the costs where they don't belong. And biblically, 
those who seek to profiteer from that situation, put themselves outside the gospel, says Timothy 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10. Beware of that love of man. The people who do that are people of corrupt minds, says 1 Timothy 6, and now we're getting back to our text. People who have been robbed of the truth who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. That's an ugly prospect for anybody, Christian or not. But you can see why Christians object, non-Christians reject when that sort of thing comes up. Godliness with contempt is great gain. That's what believers believe, isn't it? We brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. We believe that. We're not going to be over stuck to our money. We have food and clothing, that's great. Many people in the world haven't got that, we'd be content with that. And we believe, don't we, because we believe us, that those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. We know that. We know, verse 10, that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. We know that. We see that. We see that in the unbelieving world. We see it in the believing world. Some people, in the believing context, apparently eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many graves. I don't know if you've seen this in the news yet, but it might come out, the story is bound to come out. Because in this last week, the Evangelical Alliance in this country have taken a lead in exposing a book and a ministry based on that book. Exposing the untruthfulness of claims to a dramatically lawless past on part of a particular individual. And he said, okay, I had this terrible life and I was a bad, bad man and God stepped in dramatically and blah, blah, blah. It's not true. It's not true. Nine or ten years of his ministry have been based on that. And of course his support in that ministry have been based on this untruth. And the EA have stepped in. Good on them. Well done, the EA, for taking the bull by the horns and dealing with the sort of problem that this passage in 1 Timothy 6 tells us will arise and, and that Paul is telling Timothy to deal with Yonks ago in the first century AD in Ephesus. Because in this very next chapter from that last one, 1 Timothy 5, about providing properly for hard working preachers and teachers of God's word, here in this chapter, 1 Timothy 6, the people who profit here from an alleged gospel are here characterized as people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth, who think that godliness is a means of financial gain and have wandered from the faith. Because those things go together. And we've got to step in and deal with something like that because it gives opportunity for the sort of allegation that we're dealing with here today. You want me to follow Christ with you, but you're always going on about money and trying to get mine off me. If this passage tells us anything, it tells us that the objection we're attacking today better not be, in fact, cannot actually be true of the followers of Jesus because the people who do this are people of corrupt mind. Now, yes. There are people in and around God's church, even in leadership in churches with big numbers, who are always going on about money to profiteer. But this is not the way amongst the functional followers of Jesus. It's more than that. You'd be pleased about this bit. It won't be necessary to go on like this. In communities of God's people, where, where the ministry and the people who are hearing it, it should be all of us hearing it, Feed their hearts and minds long and often on the sacrifice of Christ. And actually feed their hearts and minds on the doctrines of grace. Because those are the things, not the constant harping on about money of church's leaders, that motivate and inspire, not just the dutiful giving, but the generosity of the people of God. Basically, what I'm saying is this, God's people, joyously give. Give to the work of the gospel and getting it out. They joyously give when he who despised the cross, scorning its shame, who has sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, is uppermost in their minds and affections. When the sacrifice of Christ is so clear in our hearts and minds, when we feed on that daily, when it forms our characters, we're so full of gladness and, and, and rejoicing for the mercy of God that's been shown to us free. <laughs> we want to get beyond that then, don't we? Let's put something behind it. I reckon 
and I'm going to do it in a minute. I reckon preachers who are concerned about giving might need to mention money briefly and move on the way Paul does here. Or preach one sermon for people's help and guidance, then move on. Leaving that topic maybe for a long time to come. But we should major week after week on the free gift of God in the sacrifice of Christ. Because it's the sacrifice of Christ that drives all this stuff. And that actually addresses those who are trying to profiteer from that gospel. Because that ain't consistent with this gospel. If only those who phrase this objection we're dealing with today, you want to follow Christ with them, Peter, I was going on about money. If only they had very much more reason to object that we are continually going on about the free grace of God to sinners, bought by the sacrificial blood shed on the cross. If only they had reason to be going on about that all the time. Because the love of money, not money, but the wrong sort of love for it, which arises whether you've actually got money or not. That love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I was reading a blog recently where somebody was saying that um, Christianity without Christ is toxic. Isn't that? It? Here's another example. Where that, you know, preaching the sacrifice of Christ is the central one. That's what motivates our love and our joy, you know. You know? Reflecting that gospel. That's the answer. And if Christianity as an organization or a movement or anything else has not got that Christ in the middle of it, it's toxic. Here's an example. Because it ends up going on about money all the time. And people see that and don't want to know about Jesus. Okay, conclusion. Somebody plucks up the courage to say that Jesus Christ seems really okay to follow, but his followers have always got the begging bowl out. Church roof fund, starving orphans in Africa, and you're a nicer house for the vicar, that sort of thing. What are you going to say when they do that? How are you going to respond to that objection? They probably won't put it quite like that. They say, oh, we belong over there. And that means, yeah, we've got the whole apparatus coming at us. You know, Granny's in the chapel, Auntie's in the chapel. If I don't give to that chapel, I'll have murders given me when the draw the eye comes up. So, oh yeah, we belong there. That's how they identify it. That's what they'll say. And what they mean is, there's this leeching chapel over there that's taking money off me every year. And if I don't do it, I'll get earache from my family. Somebody plucks up the courage to raise that issue with us. What are you going to say? There is no doubt there are people out there in what look to people like churches, you know, what they think of as the Jesus groupies, who are actually pretty much in it for the money. There are people who are out there who are in it for the money. What are we going to do about it? EA, EA have given us a good example this week by nailing that guy. It's not true. You've got to bring it to light. I shocked a good brother recently, again I shocked him again, uh, by challenging him to look around in the minister's conference and uh, ask himself how many of those guys in, the suits, in that conference, how many of those guys he thought would be in the job if they weren't getting paid for it? I'm sure they for it, but that's not the point. If there was some circumstance, if they weren't getting paid for it. How many of those are going to be there? And he rebuked me. A nice guy, usually. <laughs> he really is a lovely guy. I love him a bit. He rebuked me. He's a very good brother. He's not at all a profiteer. But I think he was wrong to rebuke me for that question. It's an important question. It's important to get the right answer. That's not to say preacher shouldn't be properly paid. I'm not cutting my own throat here. But the Bible clearly shows something's wrong in a situation where you're not getting paid, or where guys wouldn't be doing it unless it was a career. It is at the heart of the gospel, as biblically prophesied and then practiced, that the gospel to the outside is free. That funding its messengers and the, the church's genuinely needy people too, separate category and so on. It's driven by the gospel gratitude of believers. And that seeking to profiteer from running a ministry puts a person into the category in 1 Timothy 6 of godlessness. So when our non-Christian friend objects in this way to following Christ, I suggest we need to openly and honestly tell them what we see the Bible says about this. Here's what the Bible says, but the trouble with human nature is we're all too easily grabbing onto what we think is going to be permanent and isn't. You can't take it with you when you're gone. That's sinful human nature. We've got it. Let's be honest about that. And honestly search our hearts and our practice against biblical standards with them. 
So it's the reality of the spiritual life. We need to keep coming back to the Word of God. Learning, correcting ourselves again. And we may well lose that day's argument with them, them, but we may well win the approval of our God through our repentance and fresh faith. And by His grace, we might well win the hearts of those people who challenged us through this objection. Because they see that we too are sinners in need of the grace of God, in need of His free grace, day by day by day. And they may well identify with the idea that they need that too. The essence of our gospel is free. And if we've gone wrong on that, and people have been led away from the faith on that, then what we need is fresh repentance. And returning to God. And demonstrating that gospel principle to those guys. Jesus looks like a good idea. But you guys are always going on about money. Well, let me tell you about what's free. It's a free offer. The gospel is free. That may well motivate us in all sorts of other directions, in what we do with ourselves and, and so on. It may well. But those who profiteer from this gospel actually deny it. And that's something we've got to be careful about. Well, it's not an easy objection to deal with, is it? But it's a live one, we've got it. Let's be aware of it. And let's also be aware that it's nothing new. And it's nothing peculiar. It's awareness.